Hello, I'm Matt Everett, and welcome to the first time on Six Music. This is the series where we meet some of the most influential and best-loved musicians around and look at the seminal first musical moments that shape their lives and their careers. Today's guest is the singer with one of the best and most important bands of all time. And that's not an exaggeration. They're one of those artists whose drive to make something new, to make something extraordinary, changes the musical world around them. Just like Bowie did, like Talking Heads did, like Aphex Twin or the Velvet Underground or the Beatles. We're marking both the 20th anniversary of their album, OK Computer, and their Glastonbury headlining set here at the station. So as part of Six Music Celebrates Radiohead, I'm very happy to say my guest on the first time this week is Tom York. Here in a very rare interview, Tom looks back at his very earliest musical influences, the very start of Radiohead, and how the band work, how they learnt to create albums like The Benz and OK Computer. And we discuss the making of that landmark record and the emotional pressure that Tom experienced during the time. We also talk about the political aspects of his songwriting, especially in connection to their last album, A Moon Shaped Pool, and the band's future. Plus, we play some amazing music from Can, Aphex Twin and Gil Scott Heron. But I started by asking Tom the traditional first-time question. The first question we always ask everybody on the programme is the very first time they were aware of music as a kid. Can you remember? Yes. <laughs> what was it? My grandma Sly bought me... Is it Mungo Jerry? In the summertime... In... Oh, man, I still love that song. And... I saw the video they did. It. There's chops on the guy. Wow. It's a great tune. It really is a great tune. Everything about it is like... What the hell were these people on? <laughs> is it true that your parents didn't have a hi-fi in the house till you got one? They still don't. <laughs> <laughs> we had some dodgy, like, ITT cassette player, and uh, my dad had a dictaphone for his work, which I nicked and never gave back. That was pretty good, actually, that one. And um, we had the hi-fi in the Volvo. <laughs> what can you remember hearing in the Volvo? Uh, Queen, a lot. Before that, unfortunately, the, the Volvo before that was an 8-track of Scottish dance tunes. I even listened to that when I was, like, six. Not kidding. What about the first single? Um, oh, single. Never did singles. I only started buying singles when I started DJing at college. OK, well, the first music that was yours that didn't belong to your parents then? Uh, that was Queen's Greatest Hits. On cassette. Strong Which album. I wore out. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, after that, I don't, there was a period of, like, Really dodgy heavy metal bands. You know, some hi-fi, people had those hi-fis where they had a microphone and the only way you could record your mate's records was to stick the microphones in front of the speakers of the other record player and record it. So there's this weird sort of tone to it. Listening to some really, really bad heavy metal like that. Well, obviously the ACDC album Back in Black was in that. Look. <laughs> <laughs> first gig. First live music experience. Weirdly, not many things come to Oxford. Now or then, <laughs> uh, Joan Armatrading came to the Apollo and uh, she had a song I really liked at the time when I was a kid. And she was great, actually. Her voice, I still love her voice. Weird choice, but, but I mean, I really, really enjoyed it just because it was nothing. It wasn't angry, it wasn't anything, but her voice was so incredible. Do you remember sort of thinking, I could see myself? No. Oh, no. no. That was much later. I didn't really think that until I saw Susie and the Banshees. They played at the Apollo, and she just broke her leg. That was my favourite gig in Oxford. I met her once and went on and on. And on, <laughs> on. Embarrassed myself. But I think, for some reason, I didn't really see that much live stuff when I was a kid. But that one completely blew my mind because she came on and she was in, you know, on this crutch thing. And I, I'd never seen anyone manage to captivate an audience like she did, you know, with, with nothing just basically with her state of mind. The fact that she, she was absolutely gonna nail it. Didn't matter what happened, she did not care. And it was amazing to watch, you know, watching Budgie, it was an amazing show. And then we went to New Order a week later and they slagged everybody off and stormed off. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's how not to do it. <laughs> What's the Susie track we should play? Happy House. The anthem of crashing other people's parties. Stealing the records and booze and then leaving. Was Colin the first person you met in, the, in terms of who would become Radiohead? I guess he would have been. Uh, I went on this weird recruitment drive <laughs> in, in my own head. Yeah, because 
I'd heard that he joined this band that I'd sort of left. Um, and I felt really sorry for him because he was playing bass, but they only had a really short lead. So it was, you know... Tethered to the, to the <laughs> yeah. So I put him down on the list. And I knew his brother was like this big genius, but a bit younger. And um, I'd heard there was this really great drummer, a bit older. I was trying to find out who it was. And then... Ed was just walking around looking like he's in the Smith, so obviously he was going to join. Standard. <laughs> what were your first impressions of them all? I don't really remember. I just, I just remember that it was like we didn't really need to say much. We just sort of got on with it. Really, it was uh, one of my my favourite early experiences was doing this four track demo with with Phil in his house around the corner from school, and it was actually good. I mean, I'm still trying to find it. <laughs> I, I know it exists, but. Uh, Lock the door, it's called. And it was really cool. It was, had this really cool lo-fi quality about it and thinking, oh, right, maybe we can actually do this. Maybe, you know. Were you quite driven at the start? Um, I certainly drove my parents around the bend. Absolutely drove them crazy. My bedroom was above the TV room and I had this amp in there, this Mizabugi amp. And those things are loud even when they're quiet. And they'd try and watch TV every night and it would just be me trying to track things on a four track or whatever just I don't know how they put up with it I really don't <laughs> um, and now I have a house with two kids who do the same thing to me all day long every day dad god no no they're the ones playing the music and oh, I'm like right. <laughs> listen can can <laughs> what can you remember from the first the early Radiohead gigs can you remember anything from them I remember one with a drum machine which was a bit awkward that was a bit pants um we did one at the school, and that was just excruciating, really embarrassing. What, like an afternoon gig for school kids? Yeah, it was terrible. And I do remember, well, it's not really relevant, but I remember the big punk gig that got all the school, got all, all rock music banned, apparently. There was all these punk bands. When I first joined the school, when I was only 13, I mean, it all sounds ridiculous we talk about it now, but all these kids from town came and there was fights and someone's got stabbed and those are the seats and this brand new beautiful our new arts theatre got slashed and all this stuff and so the the headmaster used that as an excuse to ban all contemporary electronically amplified music for the rest of the time I was at school which is a bit awkward so it was always a question of uh, trying to work around that how did you work around her? Um, I was very lucky that we were very lucky especially me that the head of music was having none of it so there was an open warfare going on. Because <laughs> I've interviewed all the rest of the guys now, and you're all... I can't... It sounds like a very obvious thing to say. You're very, very different. We're all nutters. But, uh, I, I was always the nutter. And that, I've seemed to have infected them all. Why did it work early on, do you think? Um, it worked because uh, we supported each other a lot in a kind of a really interesting way. And everyone was coming to it from a different point of view which was actually really good. Johnny comes to it from the point of view of searching to find the notes you shouldn't use. <laughs> Always has done. And the sounds you shouldn't use. Colin comes to it, to it from the point of view about arrangement. Phil comes to it about, like, feel, obviously, because he's a drummer. Ed's coming with these extra sounds and stuff. But also outside of that is how we approach everything else, you know. Like, some guys in the band... Even before we signed any record deals or anything like that, they'd read all the books. They'd spent a long time reading about where the music business was at. Really? Yeah. In a, in a way that was totally uncool. <laughs> but in a, it, was, it was actually really good because at the time, you know, we signed to EMI and everybody slagged us off because it was all about indies. It was all about creation records. It was all about... And we'd be saying, yeah, but most of these indies have got like licensing deal to major. No one listened to us. And it was like, we were just saying, well, this is just hypocritical bullshit because actually you're still working with the man anyway, you know. And things like that actually really helped us in the long run. But at the time, uh, people just thought we were nuts. First impressions of Nigel. Oh, God. He was editing, when we did Planet Telex, I think it was. He produced one of those really early little Apple Macs and did like all this editing on the drums whoosh, and then threw it back onto onto the multi-track without any, like a blink. And I was like, wow, I've never seen anyone do that before. You know, it was all about momentum and all about 
I don't know. And, and, and he, he really just felt like um, we were contemporaries of each other in a certain way, you know, of peers. We, I think, in the process of doing the bands, when we got to sort of the end of it, we, we really got obsessed with the whole DIY thing, mm. but doing it in the context of not lo-fi, you know, doing it like can. And we'd been reading books about how can recorded and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, obviously all the usual suspects like the Beatles and so on. We were actually really getting into the techniques. And, and Nigel was like a library of information on all this stuff. You know, when we went to him and said, do you want to do this with us? We're going to buy all our own equipment and do it. We want to just do it ourselves, independent of everything. It was obvious that we'd, he would ask him because there's no, it wasn't even anyone else we were considering. You mentioned Can. What's the Can track we should play at this juncture? Oh, my God. I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> Future day is always. Okay. That's how you should start every morning. With OK Computer, you mentioned this before, this idea of, of just kind of buying all this gear and doing it. I mean, as much as a record can have an agenda, was that the agenda? Just total freedom and our own space, our own equipment, and just go into it with complete abandon? Yeah, like a sort of warts and all thing. We were listening to Morricone, we were listening to Can all the time, Faust, general sort of crap, early craft work, Pendereski, all this stuff on the back of the bus, you know, all the time. And uh, we were kind of fascinated about that, that warts and all recording thing, like things that are distorted, things that uh, the mics aren't in the right place or it's all really top-endy or it's all... It's imperfect mm. because, you know, we gone through this interesting process of, like, we signed to a major record company. We, we were working in a world back then where if you make a record, you go to a studio and you... We were the last sort of generation, like, to actually... You can only make record in a studio. So you turn up in the studio. It's a thousand pounds a day, but no pressure, right? <laughs> um, it was just like, mm, I'm not sure about this. This doesn't feel right at all. You know, and then gradually realising, actually, no, you don't have to do it like this. And then realising the technology you choose to use and how you choose to use it is part of your art and should be in your hands it should be part of the creative process. And Nigel was absolutely like an enabler for that, to saying, yeah, this is all free range. It's free range, you know. So the stuff we were listening to felt like those artists had the same approach, you know. Mm. It, pff, I don't know. It, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, no surprises, that was first take, wasn't it? Yeah, I heard, I heard Johnny say that. I think that's right. All I remember is... We argued about how fast it should be because I had, there was this whole thing, oh, it was me, but we had this whole thing about, it had to sound like we'd all taken Mogadon. <laughs> because, <laughs> <laughs> and so we tried to play it as slow as we could, but it was never slow enough because we weren't on Mogadon. So, so what we did was we took an earlier version, we just slowed it right down and it, uh, you probably, it's, we experimented, it slowed down around, the, you wouldn't know it slowed down unless I told you, mm. but it is. So it has this, because of what I'm singing, um, you have to have something that's not right about it. Yeah. Um, and I do remember, I think the vocal we ended up using was a vocal, <laughs> the first place we recorded at was like these metal tin sheds where we did rehearsals in this farm, in a sort of derelict bit of the farm with broken bits of shit everywhere staring at Didcot Power Station outside doing the vocal in the sunshine with Didcot Power Station kicking his shit into the air. It's perfect. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if OK Computer is your Sergeant Pepper kind of live, that's your free bird, I think. It's still for a really dark as hell tune. It's got that, oh, everyone has this emotional that, moment. Which, which to me is like, exactly. you understand the irony, right? <laughs> but it's it, it has been a really... A weird, like, call to arms is not the right word, but over the last few years when we play in America, it always gets this huge reaction. Uh, the, the bring down the government bit, sometimes you get real shivers because people start yelling. It started happening a few years ago um, at the end of when Bush was in power, I think. People just start yelling spontaneously. It's quite a... It's kind of... It's great. <laughs> I don't know why. It was such a unpunk song would would have... Re release this kind of weird anger. 
Sorry for comparing it to Freebird, you know what I mean. Yeah, great choice. <laughs> I was hoping for Anakin in the UK, but all right. That was I Promise, a newly released song recorded during Radiohead's sessions for OK Computer in 1997, which features on the new 20th anniversary release of the record. OK Computer famously dealt with vast, complex contemporary themes like technological anxiety, consumerism, political apathy, globalisation and a loss of individuality, a reflection of Tom's own obsessions and experiences at the time. A lot of that record seems to be about... It's from the viewpoint of someone looking in rather than someone in it. I don't know. I can put that better. Yeah, you can. It's like the best perspective on, on how society is someone from the outside of society. Oh, and that, that seemed to be maybe that's the perspective that you were writing from rather than writing about yourself and your feelings. It was very much, we were living in orbit, you know, we living on a bus or living in a studio and uh, we barely had or taking any time off at all for quite a long time. So whenever you did step back into life in any way at all, it was like, what's, what's, sorry, what's this? Can't, does not compute, get it? it you know, in a way, a, a sort of privileged perspective yeah. to, to just be pulled out of things so much and just totally involved in working on music. That's it, all time. Uh, to the point where it was just it was get, it was too much, but it did mean that what I ended up writing about was was the fact that I felt very little connection with my fellow human beings. <laughs> <laughs> Not much has changed, chaps. The decision to go back and do and do the box set as a band that's always looking forward, I don't, it's it's a pleasurable surprise to sort of see you going back and going, okay, we're going to revisit this. I really stuff. enjoyed, well, enjoyed maybe it's not quite the right word. I really, it was really interesting. Some of it I really enjoyed. Some of it was absolutely fascinating. The notebooks turned up in the office in a box. Um, so these are what, little studio notebooks? All my notebooks for that period, which I couldn't work out where they were. And then all the tapes turned up and all the cassettes. And then we dug up all the multi-tracks and blah, blah, blah. But I guess my particular angle on it was what I found really fascinating was my sort of real, the weird way in was, was, was going through my notebooks at the time and just making friends with whoever this nutter <laughs> was. Did it feel like that? Oh, my God. I think I'm <laughs> bad now. Just pages of, like, seriously, mate, <laughs> you need to take a break. <laughs> But um, but also in the sort of obsessiveness, you'd, you'd have these like, wow. I was obsessive about taking notes, about that was the only way to feel that I was making sort of progress. And, and I'd had endlessly do different versions of the lyrics, endless, endless. There's like, you know, 30 or 40 different versions of Paranoid Android. 40 different versions? Yeah, it, just in different pages, I could endlessly write out. and re I'd, That was when I could see. So the notebooks are really small. And the lettering's really, really small. <laughs> Slightly different. And you know, I'd only changed like five words. It's like it was like a meditation when sitting on a bus going somewhere, you know, and write it out again and again and again. Underlining this for me was the sense that like I didn't have a real job, but I, w I wanted to. Uh, but this was work, and my notebooks at the time were my point of focus pulling everything together, whether it's ideas about arrangements or just observations or just random drawings or whatever. It was like, I, I have a job. This is my job, which is nuts. But, but really, it was, you know, that's how I sort of dealt with the fact that, like, I was just a bit of guilt involved, you know, like, I'm not really doing anything with my life, but I'm doing this. Anyway, by the time we'd finished the record, um... We had a meeting about what we we're going to do for the shows and stuff, and uh, I, I was like, I can't do Glastonbury. I can't do it. Really? No, I can't do it. I, I, I burnt myself out making the record, and the idea of having to put myself back, you know, it was it was a weird time for me. I just, I got, got really obsessed, and it was sort of a little bit of all, I just needed a break, and then, in fact, we didn't get one for another year and a bit, by which point I was pretty much catatonic 
But you know, come back with Glastonbury, nice no stress gig, nothing went wrong. Yeah. Ran really it was smoothly. Pretty, yeah, it was pretty exactly. It was exactly like I thought it would be. All brilliant for I, someone's state of mind. This is all it was, it was really you can imagine, can't you? <laughs> and yeah, at one point in the show I just went over to Ed. I tapped him on the, old, on the shoulder and said, I'm off, mate. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned around and went, if you do, you'll probably live the rest of your life regretting it. I'm like, good point. <laughs> In terms of how Radiohead as a group work, someone I think was asking you about this idea of a band democracy and you said... I'm America. Radiohead's like the United Nations. Yeah. I'm America, which is obviously got uh, maybe overturned you don't really want. These yeah. <laughs> They've got Especially, worse. And uh, now it wouldn't work anyway. <laughs> exactly. I'm is that America. Confused? Angry? <laughs> ineffective? Is that still the case? Uh, has it changed? I don't know. Much? Um, has it changed? Uh, uh, mm, I'm less of a nightmare, why usually. Is, why is that? I just got bored of it. I decided <laughs> I needed to enjoy my work before it killed me. You know, and I, also I, I, over the years I felt like, okay, I guess if I'm honest with myself, I felt that, that I've wanted to, it was like an insatiable hunger to um, find something and then realizing actually it's not about that, it's about the process. Yeah. You know, it's about feeling free to enjoy the process of, of writing and recording a piece of music. That's it. That's all it's about forever. Amen. You know, particular examples stick in my mind. Like everything is right place, which was one of those ones we went round and round and round in circles until eventually I was ushered off into a room and said, "Just, just put it on the synth and sing on top." Oh yeah, okay. And then, uh, and then something like daydreaming, where I never, I didn't have a clue where the hell, how the hell we were going to get that together, and um, made myself absent again and came back, and Nigel and Johnny just created the bare bones of it from. You know, really, really fast, and it just came together really quickly. And and then he was talking to me about cellos, detuned cellos, following my voice grunting, and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. So, it, it, to me, you know, the, the, if anything's changed, it's just now uh, I, I look forward to those moments mm. where you feel like the door's still open and the possibilities are still there to do something you don't expect. How is it dealing with that level of scrutiny, though? Because well, I don't feel it at all. I mean... I think it's funny. It's a I joke. Mean, all I care about is, is our scrutiny, if that's what you mean. I mean, it, it, nothing else is relevant yeah. at all. I stopped reading what people think about our records long time. <laughs> I went through all that. Yeah? Uh, yeah, after OK Computer. Like I said, I was catatonic, and I, I was trying to work a lot on my own when we were having a break, and... It was weird, man. Like, every time I picked up a microphone, a monologue would start in my head and I'd start pulling pulling apart whatever I was doing before i even done it, you know. Um, and, and it was about that. It was about... Uh, you'd, I'd sort of got into a habit of having to have conversations about our work and listening to what people said and their interpretations of my lyrics and all this stuff. And it, it eventually, like, okay... That's enough now. But it took me a long time to sort of shake it out of my head. You know, a really long time. Like, most of uh, 1999 and 2000, I was really struggling to get free of, of that sort of corrosive analysis. I was like, Am I really? <laughs> you know, luckily at the time, I, I was trying to learn to surf. That kind of helped because I'd come out of the water... Just relieved I hadn't killed myself or drowned. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, put it in perspective. Also, this idea of, ah, like, oh, the incredibly sort of tortuous and difficult process it was like, but if it wasn't, if you weren't getting something from it, you'd stop doing it. Yes, You would all stop point. doing it if it was, if it was as... Oh, uh, well, that really came into focus you know? when, you know, when we suddenly all had families and kids and you got to, like, if you're going to go and choose to do this, you're going to go and sacrifice the time... Watch that you should be at home watching your kids grow up to go and do this stuff. You 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 better enjoy it, otherwise you're just going to kill yourself and everything around you. Mm. You destroy everything you've worked. So for a while, obviously, me being me, I'm like, oh, you've just you've lost your edge, mate. <laughs> but um, that edge of which I was speaking was the thing that was stopping me working. Yeah. So 
Goodbye. We should ask you to pick an Aphex Twin track because oh an, God. an artist that is very important to you. Huh. It's that one he did with Square Pusher. It absolutely blew my mind when I first heard it. John Peel played it and I had to stop the car. I've never done that in my life. I had to just stop the car. Really? I was in shock. It's kind of like this weird mutant drummer bass tune that there's something in that this sort of casual collaboration where obviously neither of them really gave a rat's ass. They were just doing what they were doing, you know. But something happens in the middle of what they're programming together or through together. Something happens. It makes you go, oh my God. When did you first get politicised? I would say... I'm one of Thatcher's children. So, boom. <laughs> you know... And we grew up under the bomb. We still had that concept. And then going to college, getting sort of sucked into student politics was a... It, on one side, it really motivated me because I, I used to love debating. I still do. But at the same time, you see, you see how the left goes left, the right goes right. And you're like, oh, really? OK. You realise how dry it is. The student politics has sort of put me off it for life in a weird way because you, you kind of see the sort of people it attracts and makes you despair. But um, at the same time, uh, it's a love-hate relationship because I feel like I've never really been able to just walk away. I wish, a lot of times I wish I could have walked away. But I think ultimately it's always been there and our generation especially grew up with it and it was an incredibly important part of what happened in music and, and it's it's very odd that we've just got a little tipex thing and just oh yeah don't, we don't need to worry about that the first track the first thing love moon shape pool and the which seems to be implicitly about people looking for scapegoats political scapegoats people it was originally written about kind of written about the tabloid witch hunts of the paedophiles long time ago. The original impetus was um, reading some reports about... I mean, they still do it now. It's what they're good at. When whatever newspaper it was started the witch hunts and started naming where these people lived and all that stuff. But then it that was a long time ago. It got shelved and then it seemed to have its time. <laughs> <laughs> Since you started the tour, you've been playing pretty much all of that album. Do you feel the songs changing and the songs evolving? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, The Numbers is the one I really in, enjoy, and it, identical in a different way. But The Numbers is, it has like a, this really cool swing about it. But then these things always happen. The songs change. It's part of what it is like. Mentioning The Numbers, that seems to be the other, one of the other recurring passions of yours. Environmentalism, I don't know if passion's the right word. The thing rattle around, rattling around in my mind was, is it still possible to write a political song? Is it still possible to bring these subjects up and and try and get some any kind of semblance of emotion out of the corpse, <laughs> you know, of these issues in a piece of music? I was listening to this Adam Curtis podcast that um, Mr. Buxton just did, where he's talking about the fact that as soon as someone realizes, oh, this documentary is about the environment. Or as soon as someone realises, ah, oh, well, this book is about politics, um, people just switch off. Mm -hmm. They go, oh, right, I'll put that in that box over there because that doesn't mean anything to me. And um, that was the thing that was going around around my head. Why is that? Why is it that I'm not allowed to mention these things? Why is it that if I sing a river running dry, you know, that or the system is a lie, painful cliche. But it's also true. So what am I supposed to do? How else are you supposed to say the system is a lie? Why bother? Why bother hiding it? It's a lie. That's it. So it was like this weird fight with myself of like, can I get away with this? <laughs> <laughs> is this the right thing to do? Or shall I write another lovey-dovey song about nothing in particular? Does that, is that what the world needs? Or has someone else got that covered? I think so. <laughs> Are you an optimist? Are you quite positive? Yeah. I okay. mean, that song is one day at a time. Hmm. You know, one day at a time, mate. You will be impeached shortly, mate. <laughs>
you're not a leader, love, and people are going to see it very soon, love. You know, one day at a time, you can't sustain this. It's not going to work. Good luck. One day at a time. We ain't stupid. When I interviewed Phil, he said that normally at the end of a record, it feels like the last record. Until then, it's just not the last record anymore. Mm -hmm. I hope there's this desire to keep working as Radiohead. Oh, yeah, but um, I just don't know. Like usual, I don't really know the way in yet, you know? How do you mean? Well, usually something happens. You find a key idea, which, which is the thing that opens it up and everyone goes, oh, okay. But I think um, at the moment, I, I guess because I'm stuck in, I'm obsessing about everything else I'm doing. I think once um, that's finished, there will be like a collection of ideas which will give us the chance to get together, you know. And that's kind of how it works. Because yeah. the truth is, we, you know, we don't, we're not living on a bus together. So the way that we find connections with each other is through something that's being created or half created. I just want it to carry on being a process everyone enjoys. That's all I care about, you know. And something that's still a surprise. That's all I care about. What's the last song we should play? I've been umming and ahhing. It's either something from that new Clark record or Gil Scott Heron from 125 and Lennox, that record. In fact, probably that one, even though the Clark record's really good, so check that out as well. The, his version of um, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, which is on that record is just him and these percussionists and most of the whole record is just him and his poems it's very 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 angry record but amazing amazing and uh this version of Re revolution will not be televised it, it stops me in my tracks every time i hear it then that's what we'll finish up yeah good to speak to you thank nice you very one. Much. thanks very much how is the suspiria soundtrack coming along how is the suspiria it's a difficult one to say <laughs> it's it took me a while to even learn how to say Suspiria. Um, yeah, um, it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> because the, <laughs> the original soundtrack is a hugely, by Goblin, a massively iconic yeah. piece of work, isn't it? It's insane. Good one to tackle. It's an insane one. I'm not even attempting to even bother to even answer that in, in, you know, in a response to that, because it's, it's just no point. So, and it's a very, very different film. Yeah. So... Um, I don't know really uh, there's a f sort of few core pieces of it that I've been trying to piece together and uh, it's hard because it's I'm way out of my comfort zone and uh, I can't read music so it's not like I'm write, writing for orchestra so I'm building it all myself in fact I watched Blade Runner twice at the weekend <laughs> have it making that okay that oh bit. that sound oh I could do something like that that's quite easy oh I'll rip that bit off there and that bit there and we're fine no not really but just you know, Vangelis, like, he did that. It's it's him. It's his hands who yeah. made that, you know, that, which encouraged me because I think that was the thing I was finding most daunting was was um, normally for a horror movie that involves orchestras, it involves, you know, these specific things. And But Luca, the director, and Walter, the editor, are very much like, find your own path with it. Mm. You know, and they, they're giving me as much freedom as they can, which is great because, as they know, I've never done it before. Mm. So uh, I kind of have to, I just have to find a way into it, which I am doing, and it's, it's exciting, but it, it, at the same time, I am so out of my comfort zone, I don't know what's going on. But that's good, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.